From the heartland of America to every nation on earth, this is Jack Van Empe Presents The Truth in News and Commentary. Here now are doctors Jack and Rexella Van Empe. Hello and welcome to Jack Van Impey Presents. Friends, I'm going to give you some very, very serious headlines right up front, things that we will be discussing for you today. The first one, coming soon, a socialist America. Whoo, that is dynamite. And the Army report on Fort Hood, a lie. Ooh. And new arms deal with the United States and Russia, 95% complete dynamite headlines, global headlines. We'll be getting into those in just a moment. And usually right at this point, Jack tries to lighten the load and lift our hearts with a little bit of humor. But today, we're going to begin our program just a little bit differently. Jack has a very heavy heart. He has to deliver some things that are very serious to us today. And Jack, we're going to be praying for you as you do this. Rexella, I'm a Belgian American but I was born in this country and I love America. And my heart is heavy when I see what's happening, that we are speedily coming to a socialist nation. It was Peggy Noonan who recently said, the conservatives are angry with the president because he's dragging us into socialism and the liberals are angry with him because he's not taking us into it fast enough. But it's coming, ladies and gentlemen, just like it has come in Canada already. And the New World Order is going to be entirely socialistic. Eighty years ago, one of the great preachers in Chicago at the Moody Memorial Church, Harry Ironside, said, someday there will be a New World Order, a one world government, and it will be totally socialistic. That's why America has to soon become part of that, and it's coming. So there's a heavy heart. And Isaiah 58 once says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions. Ezekiel 33, 3, blow the trumpet and warn my people. Paul could say in Acts 20, 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And that's the way I felt this last week as I prepared today's program. Now, Jesus talked about false Christ and false prophets in Matthew 24, verses 5, 11, and 24. You can always tell a false prophet in that he is always politically correct. He wants to be sweet and loving. He wants everyone to appreciate him. But Jesus said in Luke 6, 26, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you! For so did their fathers to the false prophets. What happens to a man who takes a stand and I've promised God and you through my letters as partners, I will become a prophetic voice and I'm going to hit a heart I've ever hit it until the day God calls me home. I may pay a price because Luke 1147 said they killed the prophets. Mm, well, we know that God's hand is on you, Jack. God's hand is on him. We need to keep praying that God will enlighten his mind and heart so that he can deliver to us the things directly from the Lord. And today, friends, we're going to get right into our global headlines. They are, as I said, so sobering and serious. TV programs, songs, and even many movies are shocking. And let's take a look at this. The end is near. The end, the end. Again, Book of Eli, the end again. Now that is a movie existing in a demolished world. Eli, or Denzel Washington, keeps to himself talking about the end. 
18 uh, movies now yes. have to do with the end of the world. We don't believe a word of it. Well, that's my first question. I was going to ask him, will the world ever end? Does the Bible teach that the world will end someday, next few months, next few years? Will the world end, Jack? Rexella, for a number of years, I was called the doomsday preacher because they said he's always talking about the end of the world. I never did that because I've never believed it. I believe Christ is coming back to rule and reign on earth for a thousand years. So it can't end because Bible prophecy has to be fulfilled, and that's Revelation 20, verse 4. It's the liberal churches, it's the national council of churches that will not preach the rapture, will not preach the return of Christ. They don't believe it. And the only hope they have is that the world will end, but it's wrong. Do you believe this book? Ecclesiastes 1, 4, the earth abides forever. How long is forever? <laughs> forever. Psalm 104, verse 5, Yahweh God laid the foundation of the earth and it shall never be removed or destroyed. That's why Isaiah 45, 17, Ephesians 3, 21, both say it's a world without end. Now, these liberals adopted what is called replacement theology. This is blasphemous. Why? Because they said every time the word Israel appears, you just call it the church. Boy, I don't know what seminary they attended. And every time Jerusalem appears, you call it heaven. 3,400 mistranslations of the Holy Word of God. Now, where did they get this idea about the end of the world? Six misinterpreted texts. Matthew chapter 13, verses 39, 40, 49, 24, verse 3, chapter 28, verse 20, and Hebrews 9, 26 talks about the end of the world, but it cannot be the end of the world. Those are the only six verses that talk about it. And it's mistranslated. The Greek word is not, in English, world. The Greek word is aeon, age. There are seven different ages. Number six is the age of grace. Number seven is the age of the millennium. Now, let me prove this. Matthew 24, 3, the disciples come to Jesus and say, what should be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? No, it can't be the end of the world. Why? Because you turn the page and Christ comes back in Matthew 25, 31 to rule and reign for that 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4. And to those who are here, millions of them, because the world didn't end even during Armageddon, he says, come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you. So when you come to the word, end of the world, make it the end of the age of grace so that Christ can come back and rule during the age of the millennium. Now, there's just one more thing I need to say to you right now. Some of you say, well, what about the new heavens and the new earth? Oh, this is exciting. The word neos in the Greek means a new creation. The word canis means a restitution a renovation, a replacement. Every time it talks about the new heavens and the new earth, it is not a new world, a new heaven, a new earth. It is a remodeling job. That's why Jesus called it the regeneration in Matthew 19, 28 and the restitution of all things in Acts 3, 21. Look it up in Webster's Dictionary. Regeneration and restitution means a remodeling job. Praise the Lord, the world's not going to end. And soon he's coming back. And after Armageddon, he's going to replenish that which was here to its original beauty. Oh, Jack, sounds very exciting. Well, in other words, there were different ages in the Bible. This age end, that age end. Now, we're living in an age that's going to end, the Bible says. But it's not going to mean the destruction of the world, Jack says. Okay, something better is coming, and that's the return of the Lord, right? Amen. Revelation 170, cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And in Revelation 1911, he comes regally, royally, majestically on that white horse to rule and reign as the King of kings and Lord of lords, verse 16. For 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4, already said, then he's recommissioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28, and he then his reign on earth is forever and forever and forever. 
Revelation 11:15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and His Christ, and He shall reign forever, and forever is forever. The world is never going to end. Sleep well tonight. <laughs> I love it, Jack. Well, you know, friends, we're going to get into something that's very, very important, democracy. In many countries, democracy seems to have been falling for a long time and have fallen by the wayside in many, many countries. Remember the dramatic events in Russia many, many years ago. Here you see it flying the red flag. Now, there's the military leader. Leon Trotsky salutes as he stands by a friend who is Vladimir Lenin while reviewing a parade right there in Moscow's Red Square. Now, that goes back to 1919 flying the red flag, the great revolutionary dream that he had. Unfortunately, it was not a good thing for so many. And then Dave Grenland, oh, you did a great job on this cartoon, trying to connect the dots. You see what the dots are supposed to say? Change by our president. Once again, Joseph Farah, now this is World Net Daily, had this to say. As the national government becomes more centralized and bureaucratic, it will also become less democratic and more despotic than ever. Oh my, oh my, that is a dynamic statement. On the cover of National Review, Tattered Liberty, the Way to American Decline decline. And here we see it again. Radical political change, the Obama strategy to destroy American capitalism. This is from the Monetary and Economic Review. And on the cover of Newsweek, we are all socialists now. Whoa, the perils and promise of a new era of big government. And here's another statement, Frank Beckman from the Detroit News. You'll never hear Obama, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, or Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid utter the S word in relation to their policies, but it's difficult to categorize them any other way. Now that S word we all know, socialist, socialistic. Going on, Democratic Senator Evan Bayh retiring. I do not love Congress. Now that is a senator from Indiana. That shocked everyone, of course, just a few days ago when he said, I cannot go on. Now you know, I don't know if you knew this, but he was also governor of Indiana for two terms. Once again, the world must forge a new order or retreat to chaos, Henry Kissinger. Now, friends, if we ever needed to pray for our country, we need to pray now. We need to pray for our president. In fact, the Bible commands us to pray for those who are in authority, but it adds something, that they will lead us in the right way. That's something we forget. We need to pray with a definite purpose, a definite reason. Why am I praying for my country and my, my president? The Bible commands us that, Jack. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. I exhort, therefore, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and presidents, and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. But wait a minute, because God says, I would have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. So he wants all of this righteous thing going on in the earth, under the presidents, under the leaders for a purpose, the winning of lost people. And then he tells us the way in verses five and six. There's one God and one mediator between God and men. And it's the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So we're to pray for our president that he'll do what's right, that he'll not go to Georgetown University, the great Jesuit Catholic University, and have the White House call ahead and say, cover up anything that portrays Christ. We don't want to offend the Muslim. That's the purpose of it. This prayer is that he'll do what's right, ladies and gentlemen. Now, you've heard me talk about this interview we had with the Chicago Sun-Times and USA Today just about a month ago. In it, he says, I don't like that ornery old guy, Paul, because of what he teaches in the Book of Romans. Paul didn't write the Book of Romans. God did. Don't people understand this? 
It's not just a man saying it. It's a man directed by God to say it. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's of God. 2 Peter 121, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit has come after I leave, he's going to guide you into all truth for the remainder of the writing of the New Testament. Then he went on to say, I believe there are many ways to heaven. That's the New Age gross baloney quoted by Oprah Winfrey. And the president said the same thing in his interviews. I don't need Jesus. There are many ways. Well, 400 times this book says Jesus is the only way and the blood of Christ is mentioned 700 times as the way of salvation. That's 1,100. If God said it once, I believed it. And he did say it in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man, no man can come unto the Father but by me. And God showed me something this week, Rex. I'll, in 2 John chapter 1, beginning with verse 7, many deceivers are entered into in among you who confess not that Jesus Christ, God, is come in the flesh. Then he adds in verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ doesn't have God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If any man, any man, come to you and bring not this doctrine of Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, that he's God, he was virgin born, don't even let him into your house, or bid him Godspeed. For he who says to him, God bless you, is partaker of his evil deeds. He said, nobody can know about heaven for sure. I don't believe in a hell where my God would send five, six of the population of the world into eternity lost. It doesn't matter what a man thinks, a president thinks. It matters what God says. And Jesus said, rejoice because your names are written in heaven in Luke 10, verse 20. And he was the greatest hellfire preacher who ever lived. He said it more than any man in the Old or New Testaments. And he said in Luke 16, 22, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, heaven. The rich man died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Let's believe God. Woo! Now that is not Jack speaking, that's the Lord speaking, because he's quoting the Bible. We need to listen to the Bible. And I have a couple more questions I'm going to ask him in just a moment. Very, very important questions, probably on your mind. We'll give you some good news in just a moment, too. All right. Now those two questions I mentioned a moment ago, very, very important. Not only friends, I'm sure, going through your mind, does the Bible tell us to pray for those in authority, but to honor those, honor the king, the Bible says, honor those in authority. How far should we go in honoring those in authority? And can we turn America back around? Rexella, we are to honor the king and all those in authority, 1 Peter 1.17. But there's a qualification in Romans 13, verse 7. Give honor to them to whom honor is due. And with all the fuss that's going on now in Massachusetts and the tea parties, people are disgruntled, unhappy because they are not being told the truth. You see, democracy is a government by the people, for the people, and of the people. That is not what's happening. This president has 32 czars. He's controlling everything. Even Senator Byrd said, as he wrote him a letter, we have nothing to say. Your 32 czars are controlling it. And Congress and Senate don't even have the right to even intervene. Not only that, but Newt Gingrich says we probably will have the first president who will become a dictator. I believe this with all of my heart. Now, socialism you saw Leon Trotsky in 1919. He went to Russia to kill Tsar Nicholas because he wanted to get rid of democracy and wanted to start a socialist government there. And remember, socialism starts with that term and it becomes Marxism, Leninism, and communism. You say, oh, I don't believe that. You remember the title they formerly had? USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. That's where we're headed right now. And when you have a socialist government, they strip the people of the sovereignty. They strip a nation of sovereignty. They had nothing more to say. The European Union just recently signed the Lisbon Treaty, all 27 nations saying we get rid of our sovereignty. We will have nothing to say. Isn't that what the Bible teaches in Revelation 17, 13? They all have one mind and they give their strength and honor and power 
unto the world dictator. That is where this man is headed right now. I'll tell you, he is loved around the world. I want to show you something on the screen concerning communism. And that follows socialism. Look at this by Joseph Farrar of the World Net Daily. Both his father, Barack Obama Sr., and his mentor, Frank Marshall Davis, were communists. His church of choice was one of black liberation theology. That's Marxism and Christianity combined, whose Marxist roots are inarguable, this man says. He associated with far leftists on the organizing streets of Chicago, including Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorr. Mentorship and association are one thing, but what have Obama's words and actions revealed about his attitudes towards labor, capital, profits, and government control of business and industry? Socialism. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. Amos 3.3, can two walk together except they be agreed? How can you be a Christian leader and push socialism, which leads to communism. Here is an article that just appeared in Time Magazine, February 16th, The New World Order, it's here. And the UN head, Ban Ki-moon, stood in front of the Congress and Senate on November 10th of last year and said, the New World Order is in progress as of 4.25 p.m. today. It's here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last sign, Rexella. We aren't going to do much about it. It's the final sign before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were seven different signs. Israel had to be a nation. They had to capture Jerusalem. There had to be a European Union. They had to be talking about giving the mark, 666, which they did Chancellor of Virginia as the Bilderbergs promoted that just a year ago. And there had to be a powerful Russia, powerful China, and as well, an Iran who wants to get rid of the Jews. They were the final seven signs pointing to the eighth sign, the new world order. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Jesus could come at any moment. That's our only hope. I would love to say, oh, if we would just pray, we could get this thing licked. But the Christians are going to be gone soon. Come up hither and we're going to sweep through all of this area of space, 187 trillion billions of miles, in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. So we're not going to be here, the true believers, to pray about the change of America. It means a world government under socialism. Well, you know, Jack, we may not be able to change the world, but we can change ourselves. And the way we can change ourselves is to allow Christ to come into our hearts to allow Him to change our minds, our hearts, our desires. And when we receive Him, we'll be ready for that great event when He comes again. Do you want to change? The Lord will change you if you open your heart to Him. I promise you that. The Bible promises that, doesn't it? It really does, Rexella. If any man or woman be in Christ, they are new creatures, new creations in the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So pray it. Get the change now. Heavenly Father, I want to be ready for your return. The world's in a mess. But right now, I'm asking you to be my Savior. That precious blood was shed to wash me from all my sins. And I lay it all on you now, Jesus. Be my Savior today. I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. I trust that you prayed that prayer with Jack. What a beautiful prayer it was, Jack. Knowing that when we receive Jesus as our Savior, we're forgiven. Not only changed, but we're forgiven of our past. And change will come in our lives. We'll desire new things. So I trust you prayed that prayer. There's my address on the screen. Please write to me. I'd love to send you this wonderful little book at First Steps in a New Direction. So many of us need to turn our lives around and go in a new direction. We're not going to go there alone. The Lord will walk with you every single moment of your days in the future. How good it is not to be alone. Not to feel alone, but we can know that Jesus is with us every single moment of our life in the days ahead. Write to me. First steps in a new direction will be in the mail as soon as I hear from you. And we have a wonderful offer for you. Perfect ending. It is a perfect ending when the Lord comes. And here's our announcer to tell you how you can receive 
Perfect Ending by Dr. Jeffries. And I have a bonus for you, and it has to do how we can have peace and joy today. And Dr. Williams and I will be talking about what's going on in the Middle East and how that concerns us right here. What's happening over there concerns America very, very much. All right, Bob? To order your copy of the book Perfect Ending with the bonus DVD, How Can We Have Peace and Joy Today? Have your credit card ready and call toll-free 24 hours a day, 1-800-JVI-7777. To order by mail in the U.S., send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Van Impey Ministries, Box 7004, Troy, Michigan, 48007. In Canada, send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Van Impey Ministries of Canada, Box 1717, Postal Station A, Windsor, Ontario, N9A6Y1. Thank you so much, Bob, and I do want to encourage you to make the call or write to us, perfect ending. You can be ready for that perfect ending if you prayed that prayer just a moment ago. What your eternal future, why it matters today. So please, make the call for the wonderful offer, perfect ending, and for your bonus that I will be including, how we can have peace and joy today. I think you're gonna want to maybe share these things with other people. So make the call or write to us. Now let me just leave you with this wonderful thought. If God had wanted us to have a permissive society, we would have given us 10 suggestions, not 10 commandments. Look forward to being your home again next week. And until then, remember, God cares for you. So do we. Bye-bye.